so just as participants are joining, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Brian Spears, <clears throat> and I'm uh, greatly honoured to be the president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. <clears throat> Today, we are presenting the first in a short series of webinars uh, to do with the Privy Council. And you're all very welcome indeed, and will have been impressed by the very distinguished panel that has been assembled under the chairing of uh, Lord Carnwath. And we very much look forward to what the panelists and uh, Lord Carnwath have to say. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council is, of course, the final court of appeal uh, for Crown dependencies and overseas territories, and for many uh, mostly Caribbean jurisdictions who regard the Privy Council as the, their last court of appeal. Uh, rooted in the history of the Commonwealth, it plays an important role in deciding a wide variety of cases and developing jurisprudence of importance, not just in those jurisdictions for which it is the final court, but across the Commonwealth. For that reason, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association is delighted to uh, present this webinar on the subject of new developments in constitutional and public law cases at the Privy Council. And we also look forward to the remainder of the series, uh, which will be presented in December and January, and look out for the publicity regarding those. The Commonwealth Lawyers Association is just back from its conference in Nassau, the Bahamas. One of the first, if not the first, in-person international legal conference. And we were very pleased to have such a large turnout with excellent uh, sessions, both in their range of subject matters and in the quality of the speakers. We included there one on the Privy Council, and that engaged uh, many of our delegates and provoked much discussion and debate. Lord Carnwath was involved then and is involved today and uh, will guide us through these cases and uh, hopefully will bring some insights to the working of the Privy Council. And uh, Richard Clayton and Rowan Pennington Benton were also present in uh, the Bahamas and contributed uh, to many sessions as well as to the one on the Privy Council. Therefore, uh, colleagues, they are well placed to contribute to our topic today. And I look forward to hearing from them. And it's my great pleasure to bring you this greeting on behalf of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. And now to hand over to our chair, for this webinar, uh, Lord Carnwath. Over to you. Well, thank you, Brian. And um, it's very good of you to join us. And can I again congratulate you on what was a very successful Commonwealth Law Conference in Nassau, which we all enjoyed very much and learned a lot from. And it was very much due to your leadership that it was able to go ahead and be such a success. Now, um, welcome those who are attending this uh, session. The idea is to look in some detail at typical cases from the Privy Council and see what lessons we can learn about the way they proceeded and were dealt with. It's of some interest to me as having been a member of the Privy Council and sat on many cases to find myself now listening to a critique by two distinguished practitioners uh, Richard Clayton QC and Rowan Pennington Benton are both very regular uh, participants and advocates in Privy Council cases. I think their, their details should be available on the website, but I think they're very well known to most people working in this field. Um, now, the, they've selected five cases. I'll just go through them quickly. The First is Commissioner of Prisons and CPSAD, which is 2021 UKPC 13. Uh, Richard Clayton will start by discussing that. 
We then have a case called Silly Creek Estate and Marina Limited against the Attorney General of Turks and Caicos, that's 2021 UK PC 9. The third is Barbosa and the Minister of Home Affairs, 2021 Weekly Law Reports 169. Fourthly, Archie and the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago, 2018 UKPC 23. And finally, Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago v. Dumas, 2017 1 WLR 1978. And we'll make sure that the references to those are given on the website. Uh, and we will they will take it in turns to talk about them. The plan is they shouldn't take more than eight minutes for each case, which will take about 40 minutes or so, and that will leave us time for questions. And I hope that you will use the question and answer um, slot at the, on your screens to post questions on any of the cases or any points that come up, and we'll deal with them at the end. So on that basis, I should just say that I think the only one of the cases I was involved in myself was the last one, Dumas. So I'll be interested to hear what they say about that. The others are all recent cases since I left the Privy Council in March last year. But nonetheless, I think there'll be a fact that what, what they demonstrate more than anything else is extraordinary variety of subjects and cases which are dealt with by the Privy Council. So with that introduction, I hand over to Richard Clayton to deal with the CPASAD case. Well, thank you very much, Robert, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Robert, particularly for your generous introduction. Um, the case I'm going to speak about, first of all, is CPASAD, uh, which was a decision of the Privy Council on the 24th of May 2021. It's an important judgment because it stresses the wide-ranging scope and effect of the constitutional right to protection of law. In CPRSAD, the board considered whether detaining children in adult prison, contrary to Trinidad legislation to protect, designed to protect children, breach constitutional rights. The case has very recently been reported in the Weekly Law Reports 2021, one Weekly Law Reports 4315. It's a case in which both Rowan and I were involved, but I hope it's none the worse for that. The right to protection of law um, under the Trinidad Constitution, which is where this case comes from, is under Section 4B, and the effect of the judgment is far-reaching, but it's also important to appreciate that many Caribbean countries in particular enjoy the constitutional rights to protection of the law. That's true of Barbados, Belize, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent of the Grenadines, and elsewhere. The facts of the sleeper sad were somewhat unusual. The two appellants were charged with murder in 2014, which is a non-bailable offence in Trinidad. Sasha was then 16 and Brian was then 13. On the 18th of May 2015, sections 54 and 60 of the Children Act came into to operation. That legislation was enacted to give effect to the United Nations Charter on the Rights of Children. Section 54.1 required a child to be detained in a particular place known as a community residence. Section 60, uh, subsection one, prohibited the court from ordering a child to be detained in an adult prison. And section 60, sub, uh, paragraph five, prevented a child being detained in custody from associating with adult prisoners. So that was the protective regime that was created by the act. And the government decided to give, bring it into operation in May, 2015, but never did anything to give effect to it. And no proper explanation was ever given in the proceedings about the timing of its decision, the government's decision to implement the legislation or why it failed to give effect to any of its provisions. In August and September 2015, Sasha and Brian both brought combined judicial review constitutional proceedings against the chief magistrate and the attorney general seeking interim orders, placing the children in community residences. Um, and the difficulty that that faced was that there were there was a, a mandatory prohibition against granting bail and also this legislation which required children not to be kept in adult prisons. On the 7th of December, 
2015, Sasha was transferred from a woman's prison where she had been to a, a, a home for girls, which was un unlicensed and became 18 on the 24th of January, 2016. Brian was sent to a youth training center until April, 2016, when age 15, and he ne was never kept in a licensed community residence. The interim proceedings complaining about the fact that they were in the wrong place in effect uh, were dealt with and then they came to trial in May 2016 and Mr. Justice Kokoram granted declarations that they had been unlawfully detained for six months and nine months respectively in breach of the section 54 and 60 and award Sasha damages of 300,000 Trinidad dollars and Brian 250,000 Trinidad dollars. The government then appealed in 2018 December, the Court of Appeal upheld the High Court declarations that the domestic legislation had been breached, but reversed the High, Court, so the High Court's decision holding there was a breach of constitutional rights. Therefore, the sole question for the uh, Privy Council was whether the detention of Sasha and Brian in breach of the Children Act breached constitutional rights. And um, there were two issues that the board had to consider. Um, and it uh, dismissed uh, one, and it's the protection of law one which it found for that I want to deal with at more length. Um, this, Sasha and Brian submitted that there was an absolute prohibition against children being detained in ab uh, adult prison, that the scope of the constitutional right in question was broad, that the executive's failure to give effect to the legislation infringed the principle of separation of powers, and that the restriction on the magistrate's powers resulting from the executive's failure to give effect to the legislation prevented Sasha and Brian from securing an effective remedy by, in their combined proceedings. The state, by contrast, argued that the failures were administrative in nature, that Brian and Sasha were adequately protected by the law since access to the court was available through taking the combined proceedings. The Privy Council con uh, concluded these things. First of all, it looked at the question of construction of constitutions, deciding or reaffirming that constitutions were living instruments to be construed by reference to the situation and conditions prevailing in the society they saw, which, which evolved over time, and therefore they're forward looking, and that the approach to interpreting constitutions should be liberal. They reviewed the relevant case law on protection of law, but in particular, examined two decisions of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Joyce and Joseph and Boyce, and the Mayor Leaders Alliance case, which was a case about indigenous land rights in Belize. And the Privy Council concluded as follows, that the law in relation to protection of law, the right in question, is in a state of evolution. It's effectively not defined. It's a right, of, right which prohibits acts by the government which arbitrarily or unfairly deprive individuals of their basic constitutional rights to life, liberty, or property. It encompasses, but is not, um, but, but is not limited to, the right of access to the court. But it goes beyond the right of access to court and includes the right of the citizen to be afforded adequate safeguards against irrationality, unreasonableness, fundamental unfairness, or arbitrary exercise of power. And the right to the protection of law may, in appropriate cases, require the relevant organs of the state to take positive action in order to secure and enjoy the basic constitutional rights. So what they concluded in this case, SuperSAD, was the failure of government, the government to give effect to the children legislation breached its positive obligations, which were implied under uh, the, the uh, right in question. And what the case demonstrates is basically the breadth of the right and demonstrates it's gonna be quite difficult, I think, uh, to displace or to demonstrate that the right has limits. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Richard, for that um, exposition on that interesting and difficult case, but we'll, we'll be able to talk about that later, but we're now gonna to move to something completely different with the Silly Creek Estate, which is all about development of land in a national park. So we'll go straight to you, Ryan, and ask you to give us eight minutes on that. Topic. Right, thank you very much. So this is the Silly Creek Estate and Marina Company case, which is a development company against the Attorney General of Turks and Caicos. You've got the uh, citations online. 
Um, it's interesting primarily as it, it is one of those cases that um, to build, to, to deals with a dividing line between private law and, uh, and development rights and public law. The key issue in the case really was about the capacity of the governor as a member of the executive to bind, uh, when exercising his uh, private law powers of, of, of entering into leases for Crown land, whether the governor is able to bind himself when he's acting for the Crown in another capacity, and in particular in this case, in exercising his discretionary powers of granting planning permission. So um, some fairly um, uh, fruity facts here, and with a typically um, Caribbean style to some of them, the developer entered into a lease with um, the governor over Crown lands in an area called Silly Creek, which is a very um, picturesque part of uh, um, Turks and Caicos, with an intention uh, to develop housing and marina facilities and other private uh, residence um, uh, areas, which in fact was uh, done. A legal dispute broke out between the Crown and the developer about an extension to that lease into another area of land called Silly K. Silly K is a particularly uh, beautiful um, and um, biodiverse area of the Turks and Caicos Islands. A settlement agreement was entered into in respect of those legal proceedings, the upshot of which being that the government, the governor in particular, agreed to extend the lease for the developers into the Silly K area and a new commercial lease was um, drafted, which included recognition of the developer's intention to build private residences in that new area. So uh, what do you know? <laughs> it turns out that the new area, Silly K, is in fact an area designated as national parklands, effectively a nature reserve. So what the governor has done there, and this is, I should say, this is the governor some uh, years ago in the 1990s, is granted a lease to a developer to develop in the middle of what is in fact a nature reserve. And this causes a certain amount of public disquiet, as one can imagine. The uh, successive government decided to vault fast on those commitments and to deny the developer planning permission to build uh, marinas and private residences and so on and so forth in the nature reserve and the developer sues for breach of contract and in the alternative um, launches an argument based on legitimate expectations to be able to develop the parklands and a breach of the development company's property rights for the refusal uh, to allow it to do so. Now, um, cutting very much to what I think is the most interesting aspect of the case was the Privy Council's decision that um, recognizing that the governor had different roles, each of which was divisible for the purposes of um, the legitimate expectations argument. So in other words, um, it was not possible in the view of the board for the governor when executing a lease and therefore when he was exercising his private law contracting power to bind himself in respect of another of his uh, functions, namely a public law function, the discretionary grant of planning permission. Now I'm being slightly un un unfair setting the question in those stark terms because in fact the argument was more along the lines that the governor had implicitly granted planning permission by entering into the lease, which, which I think was an argument that was rightly rejected. But the interesting passage is at uh, paragraph 46 of the decision, where the board appears to go further and say, the company's argument suffers from a basic and fatal misconception. It confuses the statutory functions of the governor in land use planning with his quite separate role in negotiating and agreeing the terms of commercial lease. It elides action within the territory of public, uh, private law with decision-making subject to principles of public law. And later at the end of that passage, 
the commercial lease reflected a commercial transaction between the Crown as landowner and, as the, and the company as intending developer of the Silly K land. This, that was their only status. Uh, as I say, I would accept the argument and indeed um, um, uh, I acted for the government in this case, so we did, <laughs> we did win the point, but, but uh, um, that by entering into a lease, you can't bypass the statutory machinery governing discretionary grants of planning permission. But it does raise an interesting question as to um, the circumstances in which the government, the Crown, by entering into a contract, could create a legitimate expectation or even an estoppel argument against the later refusal of development permission or other rights promised in that contract because of course there is no uh, way the developer in this case would have entered into that commercial lease if it wasn't on the basis of a promise that it could actually develop the land. So I do wonder whether um, there is some more work to be done in terms of the relationship between private law and public law, especially in the legitimate expectations field in that regard. It does seem to me controversial to state that the Crown could never in effect, uh, uh, in general, it did it an expectation on a different department by entering into a contract. Um, Lord Carmouth, probably you will have something to uh, say on this subject, um, it being within your, I think, within your um, particular expertise. Um, am I eight minutes? Yes. I think, all right, there is another, <laughs> there is another interesting point um, on um, the legitimate expectations and the peaceful enjoyment of property. But I'll come back to that if I have time, so I don't want to run over my um, eight minutes. So I'll leave it there for now. All right, thank you very much. Mute myself. Uh, thank you, well done. I may have cut out, I think my Wi-Fi went off for a moment doing that, but that sounded very clear. And we'll come back to that point uh, about a peaceful enjoyment, um, perhaps later on. So then the next one is, um, I think, the Barbosa and the Minister of Home Affairs, which again, couldn't be more different from what we've been doing so far. So back to you, Richard. Thank um, you. Well, that that's case, uh, it's, it's in the weeklies, nine, 2021 weeklies 169. This case, as Lord Conworth has said, is, is, is different. It's actually an interesting example of the role of the common law and how that plays into constitutional rights. Um, because in this case, it was said, that the constitutional rights did not derive directly from the constitution, but were based on the common law of Bermuda. Frequently different and difficult and interesting questions uh, arise in the, in the Privy Council about how the common law impacts on constitutional rights. This is particularly re relevant in jurisdictions which state that their common law is the English law, which is the case in the Bahamas, for example, and Gibraltar. And the facts of this case were that the, app, the appellant and his wife wanted to adopt a, a niece from the Philippines whose mother had died. They refused on the basis they were not resident of Bermuda within the meaning of um, 2006 legislation. They issued proceedings in the Supreme Court of Bermuda uh, seeking various forms of constitutional relief. But the essential question for the board was first, was there a common law right to belong to Bermuda, which the appellant enjoyed? And secondly, whether the appellant belonged to Bermuda for the purposes of section 11 and 12 of the Bermuda constitution, despite the fact of not falling with those categories deemed to belong under section 11, section five. So in other words, whether the common law conveyed some sort of extra category that had to be read back into the constitution. The foundation of the appellant's case was that he belonged to Bermuda as a matter of common law, and that resulted from the speeches of, um, of Lord Bingham and Lord Hoffman in the Banco No. 2 case, 2009 appeal cases 453, where Lord Hoffman said at paragraph 44, at common law, any subject of the Crown has the right to enter and remain in the United Kingdom whenever and for as long as he pleases, the Crown cannot remove this right by an exercise of the prerogative. This is because since the 17th century, the prerogative has not empowered the Crown to change English common law or the statute law. So that was the bedrock and an important constitutional principle bedrock too. So the appellant submitted that he possessed at common law, 
the very same rights of freedom of movement, freedom of entry, and immunity of expulsion that was protected as a matter of constitutional rights by Section 11.1 of the Bermuda Constitution. However, the Privy Council held that the appellant had no relevant common law or other right which informed the proper interpretation of Section 11. They held that the concept of belonging to an overseas territory does not derive from the common law, but from the local constitution or from the local legislation. They reached that conclusion by a complex series of uh, reasons, which I will not trouble you with to discuss now. Furthermore, they decided that Mr. Barboza could not appeal to the common law itself to modify the meaning of the constitution arrived at the common law principle of interpretation. So in other words, you just can't graft on common law rights um, in the way that the appellant sought to do in that case. They therefore concluded that the Bermuda Constitution Order 1968 did not affect the appellant's position. Prior to the constitution, rights of abode in Bermuda were attached to Bermudian status. The constitution did not remove or displace any common law rights or any other relevant rights in Bermuda. So there was no question here of a saved law or anything of that kind. And they concluded that individuals in the position of Mr. Barbosa at the time of the enactment of the 2006 had no Bermudian status and no re relevant common law rights. So there was nothing to hang your hat on which could bring the case back within the realm of constitutional rights. So it's a very interesting example of which there are many and many important cases arise out of this where appellants seek to rely on the common law to bridge um, the, a, a gap as they contend um, in, the in, in the constitution. And it, it also is worth pointing out that normally constitutional rights have to be read broadly and so it's not an impossible task by any means to rely on the common law, but in this case, it failed. Thank you. Thank you again, Richard. Um, it's a, a curious case. I'm rather sorry that he lost out. It sounded a very attractive argument, but I can see why they reached the conclusion they did. Um, I, I, we're still waiting for questions and answers, please, if you have any questions or any comments on any of these cases, do use your Q&A function. Um, so, but then we'll come back to that later, but for the moment we're moving on, I think, to the, the very unusual case, yes, of Archie and the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago, and over to you again, Rowan. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Lord Carmen. Um, I think actually the board did pass some uh, comment in the Barbosa, uh, uh, Barbosa case um, to the effect that um, perhaps Parliament ought to look at doing something about the uh, position. But um, of course, <laughs> uh, uh, what you do about gaps in the constitution, a very difficult point. But um, let me get on and deal with uh, the uh, Chief Justice case. So it's Chief, Chief Justice Iber Archie against the Law Association of Trinidad and Tobago. As uh, you say, my Lord, very interesting set of facts indeed, and, and presumably quite an unusual set of facts. I think it's fair to say a number of what I would advisedly refer to as rumours about the Chief Justice surfaced in various leading uh, newspapers. Um, I think it's fair to say as someone who's done quite a lot of work in Trinidad, nobody likes a good bit of gossip more than the Trinidadians. And um, <laughs> these rumours um, gained quite a lot of traction and effectively the, the most serious from a judicial uh, independence point of view were first that uh, the Chief Justice tried to persuade the, the, secure, the, the, the Supreme Court court judges to change their state provided security detail to a private security detail operated through a company owned by a friend of the Chief Justice. And secondly, that the Chief Justice had recommended that same friend for um, state subsidized housing, which is a very um, troubled uh, area of um, debate um, in, in Trinidad. And I should say at the outset that neither of these allegations have ever been proved, and that's not what the case is about. 
Uh, the case really is about the Law Association, which is the Trinidad and Tobago equivalent, I suppose, of the Bar Association or the Law Society, um, had decided to embark upon an investigation into the facts of these allegations and had um, stated publicly that they were going to hold an investigative inquiry, essentially, into the facts. And um, the purpose of that investigation was said to be to decide whether a report ought to be submitted to the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister is the only person under the Constitution who is entitled to bring impeachment proceedings, which involve, in essence, the, um, the uh, calling of a tribunal and the consideration and determination of uh, the allegations through that tribunal process, which will then lead to a recommendation that he, that the judge be removed by the president. But, so, but before you get to that impeachment process, somebody or uh, some entity has to make a recommendation that the prime minister actually uh, triggers that process. So the law association are taken upon itself um, to embark upon that investigative process. The Chief Justice took the view that this was quite wrong for a large and high profile organization like the Law Association to involve itself in these kinds of affairs. And he launched judicial, judicial review proceedings, the primary argument of which was that the constitutional um, impeachment process Section 137 of the Constitution, the tribunal process, was the only way in which the Chief Justice could ever have his actions called into account in a public forum. So it had a monopoly effectively over the investigative process when accusations were made of, in, of, of wrongdoing by the Chief Justice. There were some other arguments which are perhaps in a sense less important. Anyway, um, he won at first instance and an injunction was imposed preventing the law association from continuing with its investigation he lost in the court of appeal each of the court of appeal judges writing a very detailed and in some respects quite very interesting and colorful reasons why um, the law association shouldn't be prevented from um, conducting its investigation um, the privy council upheld the Court of Appeal, the judgment was given by Lady Hale. And effectively, it was said that the Law Association had the same right as any other private person or organisation to look into and conduct its own assessment of allegations that have been made against a public figure. The analogy during, uh, during argument that gained traction was with a newspaper which um, may decide to embark upon a piece of investigative journalism. And it could, during that process, speak to witnesses and evaluate the evidence and form a view for themselves, which, of course, is not binding on the state. It's not binding on the prime minister, doesn't necessarily affect in any way the formal impeachment process. And therefore, there was no restriction on the Law Association from conducting its investigation. I think it was the decision slightly supported on the facts by the limits, the self-imposed limits that the Law Association had placed on itself in terms of the investigation. But um, just standing back from the case, I think one of the things that I wouldn't say troubled me about the case, but, but, but that I thought might require further consideration and development in due courses well what do you do when there is a very powerful private organization or quasi public private organization let's think in the private sphere of companies like facebook or twitter which have an enormous um, reach what happens you know are, are there any sensible limits and if so what are, is the legal basis of those limits on organizations like that that possibly hold very strong sway in the public opinion from embarking upon what will be high profile investigations of serving senior members of the um 
well, I was going to say the judiciary, but it could apply outside of that too. And I did wonder whether one of the things we might discuss is actually, well, are there some sorts of, when does the analogy between a, a newspaper in conducting an investigative piece of journalism and a large organisation going out there and potentially really causing some damage to somebody's reputation by almost taking on the state regulator's role. So um, that's what I have to say about that case. Yes, thank you, Rowan. It's an interesting case. Mm. I don't know, do we know what actually happened to the inquiry? The Privy Council said it could go ahead. Yes. Um, I know that Chief Justice Archie was actually at our conference in, in Nassau. He, he is, he yes. Well, what happened is um, the investigation went ahead and concluded, um, th then it went to, uh, the findings went to a panel of two external senior counsel to advise on whether there was sufficient um, to send the um, point to the prime minister. Um, I think there was a divergence of opinion amongst those two senior counsel, but in the end, the Law Association did send its report to the prime minister who declined to uh, commence impeachment proceedings. And then um, the Law Association or somebody else, I can't remember who, no, in fact, it was, it was, it was the Law Association, yeah. um, then sued <laughs> the um, Prime Minister and uh, for, for, not <laughs> for not starting the impeachment process or for not giving satisfactory reasons for not doing so. In fact, I can't remember if I can't remember if I can do that actually, but, uh, and then um, um, they won that actually on, I think, a failure to, some sort of quasi procedural point about not not looking at some of the evidence so then he looked at the evidence again and came to the same conclusion <laughs> that's where we are <laughs> well i'm sorry i thought there might be a, a clean answer but clearly not. Well, it is a clean answer. It's just a he's, long one <laughs> he's still in office and he seems to be carrying on very well as far as i know yes so yes. um so we then well thank you very much for that and then we come to our last one which is Attorney General of Trinidad against Dumas, and for this we go back to Richard Clayton. Thank you very much, Robert. Well, Dumas, the reference for that is 2017 One Weekly's 1978. This was a decision um, to which uh, Lord Conworth was party, uh, and he may have views he chooses to express, he may not. Um, the case uh, itself concerned a former head of the public service of Trinidad and Tobago who issued an ordinary civil claim seek, uh, seeking a relief against the Attorney General, um, essentially seeking declarations that the phrase qualified and experienced in the disciplines of law or finance in section 122 subsection 3 of the Trinidad Constitution was a requirement for, uh, for someone to be appointed to the Police Services Commission. There was a challenge also to whether the two specified persons appointed by the commission by the president met the requirement under section 122.3, which is why uh, there was uh, seeking assistance of the court on what the phrase meant. And it was also said the president had no power to nominate or subject to affirmative resolution appoint persons to the committee who did not meet the requirements. So the, essentially the complaint was that improperly the president had appointed people to the, uh, to the commission. Um, and also importantly, the claimant did not allege he was directly affected, but claimed to have commenced proceedings as a concerned citizen. That is a feature of many of the cases at least that I've seen from Trinidad. In the high court on a preliminary point, uh, raised by the Attorney General. The judge struck out the claim on the basis that the courts should interpret the Constitution only where a claimant brought proceedings um, under Section 14, which is the constitutional right to uh, relief under the Trinidad Constitution, and only in relation to the appellant's own rights. The Court of Appeal, however, took a different view they said that in addition to a claim for personal redress under Section 14, it was open to the court in the exercise of its supervisory jurisdiction and as guardian of the Constitution to entertain public law, sorry, public interest litigation for constitutional review, provided 
as was required by judicial review applications under the Trinidad Judicial Review Act 2000, that the public interest challenge was firstly bona fide, secondly had a real prospect of success, and thirdly was grounded in a legitimate public interest. And the Court of Appeal found that the claim satisfied all those three requirements. When the case became before the board, Lord Hodge, the deputy uh, Supreme Court, I think he was then the, still the deputy Supreme Court judge, um, pointed out that the appellate was not seeking um, redress for a controversy of a constitutional right in relation to himself and therefore couldn't rely on article section 14 of the constitution. He had to look elsewhere for the law in relation to the jurisdiction of the court to act. And he decided the case by reference to the following particular points, which were important. He emphasized that section two of the Trinidad constitution in common with many Caribbean constitutions states that the constitution is the supreme law of Trinidad and therefore held it was the task of the judiciary to uphold the supremacy of the constitution and the rule of law. He applied a privy council case Bob and Manning, which had cited a 1985 judgment from the Supreme Court of India, the judgment of Mr. Justice Bhagwati in a case called the State of Rajasthan and the Union of India. Uh, he also considered the question, which um, is interesting, at least from an English lawyer, as whether the Judicial Review Act of 2000 superseded the procedure for declarations under Section 14. Um, and he was really considering there the rule of O'Reilly and Mackman, which is introduced, at least in broad terms, an exclusivity to public law proceedings being taken a particular um, um, form of shape. But he decided that the 2000 Act did not supersede Section 14. In other words, they were, they were parallel jurisdictions. And he decided that because Trinidad has a written constitution, which must be interpreted and the English law does not have any equivalent to section 14 of the constitution, which would exclude the general rule in O'Reilly and Mackman. And just to remind you, we in the United Kingdom have constitutional principles, but we have no written constitution in any obvious sense. Um, in the, uh, his written case, the attorney general also sought to raise new arguments which had not been presented to the Trinidad courts. Um, it's worth noting that the board rarely, as I said, agree to hear submissions de bene esse, and it's rare for them to consider submissions not presented to the domestic court earlier. But because the appeal raised constitutional issues, the board was satisfied there was no substance in the new argument, and therefore Mr. Dumas was not prejudiced. The board dealt with them briefly, and they dealt with a number of cases, the most interesting of which I think is this one. Um, the attorney general claimed that in nominating and appointing candidates, the court's jurisdiction, the ability of the court to speak in effect, was ousted by section 38.1 of the constitution, which says, subject to section 36, the president shall not be answerable to any court for the performance of the functions of his office or for any act done by him in the performance of those functions. However, the board, or Lord Hodge on behalf of the board. So there was a complete answer to this claim that there was effectively an ouster of the ability of the court to speak on this question. The statutory protection given to the president under section 36 did not prevent courts from examining the validity of their acts. It's long been recognized that the statutory ouster clause, um, which provides a determination shall not be called into question, does not protect a purported de determination from a legal challenge, which is ultra vires and is there for nullity and reliance was placed on the famous case of Anis Minnick. Um, also uh, that approach had been taken in a case called the Attorney General and Phillips where the board considered the validity of a pardon by the president um, which uh, in relation to uh, uh, the armed insurrection of July 1919 and Lord Wolf on behalf of the board rejected the ouster. And the other thing worth emphasizing I think is that uh, there has been a, since, uh, well, very recently indeed, a very important United, United Kingdom Supreme Court judgment on the anismitic principle, the Privacy International case, which is to be found in 2020, appeal cases 491, where a seven judge panel um, decided the case where Lord Carnworth gave the majority judgment, uh, uh, in, strongly affirming there was a fundamental common law presumption 
that the supervisory role of the High Court over other adjudicative bodies, even those established with the Parliament with apparently equivalent status and power, and that that presumption could only be excluded or displaced by clear and explicit words. And that's all I have to say on that court case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, um, Richard. Uh, uh, I didn't really have anything to add on that Dumas case. I think um, we felt it was a reasonably clear result. But it's always very unsatisfactory where you find yourself in the Privy Council dealing with a case which had begun sort of three years before, and you're still simply arguing about whether the claimant has a right to bring the case at all rather than the, the substance of it. Um, but now, in terms of questions, we've got um, there was a question on the Archie case, if I can find yes. it. Um, did, did you see that? It was suggested yes. that it had a statutory mandate. Rowan, do you want do you see the question? Can you yes. just read out the question and there's a there's a there's a, a number of interventions on 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 this case which I, <laughs> I thought there well, might be. I don't want to take them all. There's, there was the one which was suggested, there's one yes. about all right, let me deal with that one then, yeah. Um, whether it was... Uh... Yes, so so there's a question here about whether, uh, from Issa Duki, whether the Law Association had a statutory mandate which required them to take up the matter. I think the answer to that is, I mean, and you probably don't mean, mean this anyway, not, not in express terms, but I think you are right that its mandate included looking into the conduct of the profession and obviously you know judges are members you know of the uh, legal profession i think certainly the law association took the view that if somebody had to engage in a preliminary investigation before making the report to the prime minister that they were probably as best placed as anybody else so uh, yes i think that's right somebody else asked a similar question about whether there's really a true analogy between newspapers uh, investigations and the investigations by an established uh, uh, law association. Of course, it's not perfect, but I really raised the case uh, uh, insofar as it triggers a broader question about the roles of these large um, organizations and societies to adjudicate on the behavior of public officials or whether there should always be some sort of state process for it. Yes, but I think it does. I, mean, I, I wondered about the analogy with newspapers because mm. the problem about a body like the Law Society taking that sort of role on, and I can see why they have an interest in doing it, is obviously that their report will have a degree of um, status and authority yes which a newspaper journal might not have. And of course, if, they, if the Law Society reaches a certain conclusion, well, that obviously raises all sorts of questions about the position of the Chief Justice. But yes. um, thank you for that. Well, without um, going through, yes. The, now, the, what the, about, um, I don't think there are any other. Hmm. I think that there is another one about, um, um, a, a question for Richard here. Shall I read it out? Yes, okay. please. Um, I'd better pre-read it first, just in case it's wild. But um, um, constitutional convention with conventional wisdom is that the rule of law is an unwritten constitutional norm. However, recent jurisprudence from the PC and the CCJ have reaffirmed the right to protection of the law, and that being intimately connected to the rule of law. Um, would you say that the right to protection of the law is essentially the same as the rule of law, couched in slightly different verbiage, or um, um, otherwise? What are the sensible limits to to to, to one can place on this um, Prothean concept? I think is how how, how you push it, Richard. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for that. Well, uh, several points to make. First, um, the protection of law is not, it seems to me, equivalent to the rule of law. Um, they are different principles. Uh, there is, of course, a debate as to what one means by the rule of law and the famous debate, at least to those of us who think it's a funny one, between the fat theory of the, the rule of law, either because it doesn't have substantive content, or the thin rule, which is purely procedural and a dicey, as dicey might have said it was, 
Um, but it seems to me the role of the protection of law is much more specific than that. That said, I mean, I really, um, there obviously will be limitations to the extremely broad uh, group uh, principle, which the Mayan leaders case expressed and which the uh, Privy Council has now endorsed twice in the Maharaj case and then in Sipersad. So um, the difficulty with a protein right or an undefined right is precisely that. Um, it's quite difficult for a defendant. So I think the answer is that that the that the, that they'll every case ultimately has to be fact specific. Um, it's I think the most interesting element of the right to protection of law is the point which Sipersad succeeded on, which is the positive obligation on the state to basically put his house in order. And uh, clearly that wouldn't bite on every uh, complaint that someone makes about their constitutional rights. What was striking about the Sipersad case was so many things were wrong. Um, one of the things that was wrong was the legislation was introduced to give effect to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. That was ignored. The children were a special category of protected people. That was ignored. Um, although in a valiant um, and attractive argument, the Attorney General sought to argue that the right of access to the court alone um, was sufficient. The reality was um, various comments were made by the justices in the course of um, the, the discussion that there was nothing that was achievable in the rights, the, in the litigation, which was to try and move the children into something other than um, an adult prison because um, although they were both equivalent pieces of legislation, both had special constitutional protection under section 13 of the Trinidad constitution, um, effectively the Trinidadian courts said the, the obligation to keep a prisoner, a suspected prisoner for murder in custody prevailed over the fact that you couldn't put them in the place designed for children. And that, that didn't attract the support of the Privy Council. So, um, you know, in a way, strong cases make strong law, uh, and it won't be every case that is quite as powerful as mm. the um, as, as the Supersad ultimately was. And, I, and it's also worth saying, I think, that uh, the case only really focused on the government in action at the, at the board level. This was a point which, um, hadn't seemed to have occurred to anyone beforehand, but if you read the evidence about what, what was, why the act was introduced or implemented, which of course is a big decision. The act had been in place for years, but the government had decided to give effect to it. And the question was, well, why if they did that, had they done nothing to, to make it work? And the answer was they did have no answer. So it was a, kick, a strong case on the facts. Not every case will be. Well, yes. you, 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 you won it again there, Richard. See, <laughs> can I ask Lord Carmel a question? Me, Rome, you're asking me. Yes, oh, well. since, you're, since you're here, well, I just want to come back to the Silly Creek and case and this yes. point about legitimate expectations. And I know, I know that this is a subject that, um, at least at one stage, you, you were interested in. And I, uh, um, I'm thinking back to your judgment in the Clico um, decision, which was. 2016, that the United Policyholders decision all about yeah, whether yeah. public sta public statement that the government would basically um, top up people's banks accounts after a run on the banks to put it well. Yeah, it's, it's a slight, it's a slight um, thing. Anyway, you um, you gave uh, a, a, um, a short concurring judgment in that in which you expressed the opinion that maybe the leadership expectations had um lost its way a little bit and ought to get back to first principles. I don't know if you um, want to say anything about that in the context of the City Creek case. Well, I think, I mean, that judgment, which as you say, was a concurring judgment, not all that short. Um, interestingly enough, I was originally asked to do the lead judgment in that case, but I got rather carried away by the problems of analyzing all the things that have been said about legitimate expectation. And I tried to, reduce those to some sort of principles. But yes. my colleagues were more interested in dealing with the facts of the case, which was understandable. And so in fact, in the end, Lord Newberger wrote a judgment on that. But um, I, I, I mean, I do think it's difficult with, I think what I tried to say in that case is a legitimate expectation, in fact, covers a number of different concepts which apply in different areas. And I, I stand by that. I don't think that particularly helps you in your 
Silly Creek case, because there the problem was the interaction between public and private law. Yes. And, you know, I think it's obviously right that the um, decision on a major planning issue in a national park should be decided objectively, should take account of all the views of objectors and so on, different people, uh, and that it should not be prejudiced by a commercial decision on the grant of a lease. So, you know, I didn't have any difficulty with that no. uh, decision. I think, that, I mean, I think would, one would expect, though, that the government in entering into a lease would make pretty clear in the preamble to the lease or something that it was without prejudice to the decision on the planning or and whatever commercial arrangements need to be made to guard against that should be there in the contract or the documents. Um, it may be on the facts of that case that wasn't made sufficiently clear, but I think the, the distinction between the private and public law elements is a very important one. So the case itself didn't surprise me. Right. Can I raise a question which I see is a question about the savings clauses because that, that seems to have just come in, uh -huh. which I think raises a very interesting raises the question about whether whether the Privy Council should go back to Rudal. Um, so I just wanted to say something very briefly mm. about savings clauses, if I may. Um, savings clauses have been very important to the Privy Council because the Privy Council has changed direction more than once. And of course, um, dissatisfaction with the approach that was taken um, was an important factor in the creation um, and establishment of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Um, the question that was raised is, will the, will, will the uh, Privy Council uh, go back to the Rudal judgment, which was a judgment of Lord Bingham's principally, or will it retain, in effect, the Matthews judgment, which is where remarkably this a seven panel Privy Council overruled a five panel Privy Council within 14 months, I think, of the original decision. And I think the answer to that is, 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 is really, well, three points worth making. The first is that there is a, an issue where this, the savings law has been sidestepped, which is going to come before the Privy Council in November, mm -hmm. a death penalty case where they're relying on the preamble to escape this whole question of the savings penalty, savings clause. Secondly, the Caribbean Court of Justice has delivered two important judgments on um, the, the savings clauses and essentially emphasized, which strikes me as it must be right, that the purpose of the savings clauses was to deal with a period of transition when the Caribbean constitution started and was not to permanently immunize pre-constitutional legislation. That's the point of difference between Matthews and the Caribbean Court of Justice. It seems to me that 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 the particularly since the judgments in question is the transvestite case and uh, or I think it's Boyce, Boyce and Joseph, but it, in any event, because there are such strong um, views expressed uh, and well and reasoned judgments from the Caribbean Court of Justice, uh, the Privy Council might be inclined to overrule Matthews and defer to the local jurisprudence. But of course, to do that, I think it would require, um, sorry, I think it was a nine judge court in, in, in Matthews with Zaka being the, um, the, the swing voter. Nine. Yeah, it was it's nine. nine. Which yeah, yeah, so it would have to be, <laughs> if it was going to, <laughs> if it was going to be, um, if it was going to come back as an issue, mm. then it, it would have to require an 11 judge court. Anyway, so it, these are just uh, thoughts for the future, but it does seem to me that the savings clause and the decision in, in Matthews is ripe for reconsideration in the light of the two powerful judgments of the Caribbean Court of Justice. So anyway, I thought that was an interesting point that was someone raised. Yes. Yes, thank you for that. I mean, I think that's a very interesting example where we're gonna get interaction between the Caribbean Court of Justice and the Privy Council. Um, this was one of the issues we were discussing Richard at our conference in Nassau, yes. where they can sort of to some extent feed off each other. And that's a very important development, I think. Um, we've got an anonymous attendee asking us whether there's a legitimate expectation when the government says it's going to um, bring in some, mm -hmm. give effect to a law. There isn't there a legitimate expectation that it should give effect to the laws through enacting subsidiary legislation in a timely manner. 
uh, Rowan, do you want to comment on that? Um, yes, I, I suppose that's, um, you, you could um, square that circle, I suppose, with the um, legitimate expectation argument. But again, I think um, I would come back round to your sort of um, words of wisdom, as it were, in the, in the policyholders' case, which is that, you know, there are other ways, you know, if there is a law that is in force, there are other ways of actually saying, well, look, if this law applies to me, it isn't being applied to me. And um, then certainly under a constitution like uh, that in Trinidad and Tobago, the most obvious argument is to simply say, well, look, it's a breach of my right to protection of the law. But if the case was brought in the United Kingdom and there was a statute that wasn't being applied to somebody, and it should be applied to them. Um, I don't know if that would be a case of a legitimate expectation or simply um, the failure to apply the decision to them would, in whatever executive context would just be an, an error of law. Um, I, might ask, uh, I might ask Lord Carmouth to tell me what the answer is to that. <laughs> or indeed Richard. Yeah, well, I think Richard, Richard's about to tell us the answer. <laughs> uh, I'm about to give you an answer, whether it is the answer is a matter for you. Um, so that's my experience of advocacy. But um, the, I th if the question was asking whether uh, uh, an intimation that mm. legislation mm. would be introduced or given effect to, oh, whether, that's, whether that is a, could give rise to a legitimate expectation, I, I foresee at least two difficulties. Oh, I see. F first is uh, the point which Lord Calmworth powerfully made in the Clico case, is that in general terms, um, legitimate expectations has to be focused on small groups as opposed to a broad generic thing or what John Laws, sadly now uh, deceased, a very uh, well-known local sure. court of appeal judge, uh, is that sort of um, that legitimate expectations on a macro level tend to be uh, very difficult to stand up. Uh, but the other problem which would strike me with the legitimate expectation is, as Lord Bingham said in the MFK undertaking case now in 1993, legitimate expectations have to be clear, unequivocal and devoid of, legit of, 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 of qualification. And the trouble with a general statement of the government uh, about what it might do is um, very often uh, there'd be a successful argument in effect, well, they may have said that, but does it really mean exactly what you claim it to be. So there's a number of difficulties, as it seems to me, about a legitimate expectation based on a, a statement that they would do something legislatively. Right. Yes. Well, thank you for that. I think we're now we're coming to the close. Um, there's some interesting questions coming mm -hmm. along now. Mm -hmm. It's actually rather good that we're, we're sort of stimulating the debate. Someone has even asked me a question about um, funding, third, third party funding of litigation, which I'm going to duck for the moment. Um, and someone said that the question of giving effect to legislation in a timely manner is addressed in a case called Sura. That's from, um, I'm afraid I'm not. Well, I, I'm afraid I did the case. I'm afraid that's not, yeah, that, that's, uh, Sura was the case where, uh, it's rather a remarkable case, where, where the government declined to give effect to the discrimination legislation which was coming into force in, 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 in Trinidad on the footing that it required a constitutional um, majority, i.e. more than 50%, in order to have effect. The Privy Council gave that short shrift, but in Surat number two, a case which uh, didn't work exactly, um, they still had done nothing, and my enthusiastic attorneys wanted to reply back, and we got pretty short shrift from Lord Bingham about that. So uh, it doesn't really say that you can't um, you can't dither about introducing legislation. Surat was really principally about the fact that um, in order to say that it was a constitutional uh, majority, that it, it was difficult to say that could be right when the discrimination legislation covered. Uh, the private sector. So, I mean, why on earth would that require a constitutional amendment? Um, and it was also an interesting case because Lord Bingham, in uh, r remarkably a dissent, um, was thought the case was really about the Jamaican gun case, the famous Jamaican gun case, and about security of tenure of judges, which the other four judges rejected. And the, the in fact, the leading judgment was given by Lady Hale, she, or Baroness Hale, as she then was. 
So I don't think it's, I don't think sir, it had the effect that you're suggesting it did. Right, well, thank you for that. I think we've now come to the end of our time. Um, it's it, what is obviously clear is that this discussion has stimulated a lot of interest. We seem to have over 100 participants, but still. So uh, as you've heard, there will be another seminar on a slightly different subject in December, but I think I'm sure Richard and Rowan would welcome comments on how, what these sort of seminars should cover and what are the most useful things to discuss. Certainly I find it very interesting yes. and look forward to participating in the future. But for the moment, I think I'll just say thank you very much to both our speakers, to Brian Spears for introducing us and for those behind the scene at the Commonwealth Law Association who've been managing the technicalities. And we look forward to seeing or hearing from you all again in, in December. So thank you all very much and we'll close it then. <laughs>